welcome. And please do turn on your cameras if you'd like to join this session. My name is Steve VY Guy, I serve as the Associate Director for the Center for Translating Research into Practice here on campus. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to this, what we're calling the BANCE Awards Information Session. And I will pull up a PowerPoint to get us started here to keep us on track for what we're trying to cover today. So what we're hoping to do in this hour long session is to introduce you to uh, and let you hear from a past awardee to get some perspective about the award, to let you hear from former Chancellor Vance, Chancellor Emeritus Vance, just to hear about the intent of these awards and what's all behind them. Give you some quick background about who the who's gotten these awards in the past and where you could find out more information about that and then spend some time looking at the application process and walking through what's required to bring that all together and give you some information about a couple of other resources and then leave some time for some questions and answers. And there'll be plenty of time for that even beyond today. So to get us started, we think it's the best place to begin with uh, hearing from one of our uh, awardees, the 2020 Community Fellow, David Craig. So David's going to take a few minutes to just talk to you about this uh, opportunity and some of the things that are important as we uh, start the process today to help you understand what's all about this award. So David, welcome. Thank you for taking some time to talk to us. Sure. Thank you, Steve. And it's good to see familiar people uh, on the call who are considering applying, it looks like. Um, so I was uh, a co-fellow with Pamela Napier in 2020 um, on a project we call the New Hip Public. And I will say that one of the things that I noticed when I was applying for this was that people had really catchy titles. And uh, <laughs> so I, I tried to get a catchy title like Invisible Indianapolis and Getting the Lead Out, I think was a Gabe Filippelli one. There were other ones that were really cool titles. So I think a cool title helps <laughs> is one thing I will say. Um, but But for me, this grant has been this grant is really about collaboration um, and knowing some of the work of the people on this call i know you all do a lot of collaborating already but to me that's what this is about collaborating across the campus but also you know uh, fundamentally collaborating with the community but in addition to that collaborating across the campus and and collaborating with students too <clears throat> um, I found when I was applying for this that it is a time intensive application. I will just say that. That's why these information sessions are happening now. <laughs> I guess there's also one in January. But it does take some time to pull this application together. And in, in my experience, um, that process was very much helped along by working with Pamela Napier, who's a visual communication design person, because Pamela and I sort of I come in and I sort of have all these abstract ideas that are impossible. And then she says, what are your goals and how should we think about this? And can we talk to our partners <laughs> and what are the ways to do this stepwise? So I think applications tend to be more successful. It's one year, right? It's just one year. So everything has to be done within the course of one year. And sometimes the applications don't come in with quite a clear map of goals and a clear timeline of the steps to get there. I think that is the time intensive part of the application process is just being really crystal clear with all of your partners <clears throat> what the goals are. And then thinking about how that builds on your current relationship with them. What have you already done? What are the strengths of that relationship that you can talk to to show that it's feasible, but also what are you going to do that's new? So that was my experience with the application process. I was grateful that Pamela is very good at chunking things out and, and rationalizing <laughs> and making sure that what we were talking about was clear. Um, so I was asked to talk a little bit about, about the application process. And again, clear steps in a plan, lots of collaboration with community partners early on. The established relationship and trust with community partners is key because you can't, you don't have time to build that in the course of the year. So you really need to have that in place <clears throat> when you're coming into it. 
for me, a big opportunity of the actual project we did, this was the first time, although I had worked with um, students through CEA, as what used to be called the SLA pro program and now the CEA program, this was the first time I had done service learning in my class, although it wasn't really service learning, it was community engaged research in a class. So for me, this was a great opportunity to try that out. And I do encourage anybody who's looking to apply to think about how students can contribute to your project. And there are lots of different ways that can happen. Um, students from Heron at the graduate level helped us run uh, sort of participatory design sessions with partners in the community. We had Heron undergrads do some visual design. Religious studies students of mine engage local congregations through Zoom, because this was during the pandemic, just to learn about their practices um, around health and wellness. So that was, for me, that's what was most transformative of this experience for my own research was working more closely with students. Um, and then strengthening <clears throat> ties with established community partners and, and building those out a bit as well. Um, it's been helpful to me too. The, the project we did focused on uh, the Healthy Indiana Plan, which is Indiana's Medicaid expansion. Medicaid has been dramatically different during the public health emergency, and that's about to end. So we're in a moment where people are gonna be going back to the old rules of Medicaid. And this research has allowed me to work with a, a whole group of organizations in a kind of ad hoc group called All Hands on Deck Medicaid. That's insurers, healthcare providers, lots of folks trying to figure out how to help people navigate the, the return of these rules changes. So having the community partners, building out that community partner network has been a really big part of, of this project from my perspective. Um, so those are my main thoughts. Is that what you're asking me to do, Nori? <laughs> yes, that was good. Thank you for your uh, tips and advice and experiences. Thank yeah. you. Okay. So David, what I what I was hearing from you is uh, that this is a time limited project. It's significant uh, opportunity with resource, but it means you already have connections with community partners, established relationships, and you use this as a, a springboard to do the big next important work, and that it's really helpful to to include students as well as campus and community partners in this work and to highlight that. So awesome. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. And yeah. we'll have a chance for people to be able to learn more about this, uh, what everybody has done, the breadth and depth of the different work as we go through this time and even beyond today. So thank you for taking some time to share that, that perspective with folks from the applicant perspective. We really appreciate that. And now we want to shift and welcome Emeritus Chancellor Charles Bantz, who is why we're here. We have this opportunity. So Charles, please welcome folks. Give them the background about how these awards were created and what the intent was so that they have a sense of this opportunity. Great. I'm happy to do that and signal me if uh, any audio problems. I didn't get my You're test. good. Excellent. You're doing fine. Uh, yeah. Uh, this came uh, out of sort of the decades of effort of the campus and the faculty on the campus to be engaged. Um, and during the course of my chancellorship, um, it became just so clear that one of the opportunities we couldn't fulfill everything we wanted to was to have faculty with students and staff and their community partners have a chance to work very intensely with financial support. Uh, it's very challenging for faculty to take a very significant amount of time during the course of a year uh, without some opportunity uh, to either buy out of teaching, to have support for other kinds of things that it takes to partner uh, and to have students who can invest the time. So as I was asked, is there something that the campus could do to 
remember uh, the, the service that I had. Uh, it struck me that I would, uh, partly because I've been married to a professor for 40 years, uh, that uh, not quite, but close, uh, it was really clear to me this was an opportunity to make something happen uh, for faculty and the campus and the partners and students. Uh, and we wanted to try and do it at a level that simply wouldn't be able to be done otherwise. And so the Bantz Fellow was put together and the idea is to provide a significant amount of resources plus an opportunity to work through uh, the Vice President for Research's office in order to get the opportunity to purchase time out uh, from your department, depending on the unit you're in and, and so forth. And to really do what you heard David describe so clearly, which is push an, uh, an enterprise, push a project to a level of effort that simply couldn't happen. And that's happened. I mean, that's what's been so fun. Uh, Paul Mullins and Sue Hyatt were the first fellows uh, that were selected. And interestingly, they were colleagues for many years. Uh, they'd not worked on a project together. I was sort of startled by that because they seemed pretty obvious people to do that, but they also did different kinds of work. Uh, one was a cultural and one was an archeologist and uh, they're all the other aspects that keep people busy doing their own work. And this was where Invisible Indianapolis came from. And uh, I think uh, without a doubt, it was as good a kickoff as we could have ever dreamed uh, because they engaged so deeply in the community. They did a conference that brought people from elsewhere. And I went to that uh, day and it was just amazing to see uh, the Landmark Center uh, Auditorium uh, very full, not the, not the sanctuary at the Landmark Center, but the uh, auditorium area. It was just a terrific. And that's been the history of each one of them in very different ways. Gabe Filippelli is a, was a bench science guy who, you know, got concerned about lead, uh, pursued that and then realized he needed to some way scale the investigation of lead in the soil. And darn it, if young people can't be trained to do that work. And uh, so here he was educating people. So uh, those, those kind of fellows. And then the scholar program was an invention of the moment in the very first selection. And we are so thankful to our colleagues in the uh, research office, and I see Etta Ward is on this call, and Etta is the uh, champion of this effort for us we, and has been in so many ways. Uh, and the scholar came up because we had, we were comparing Paul and Sue with somebody who was very new career, was about to try something that was new for him, uh, taking something into a new direction, and you know, the, I guess the mentor and all of us in the committee said, this would be exactly who we'd like to support for our next generation of somebody who might become a fellow. Uh, and Simon Atkinson was the vice chancellor for research at that moment and bless his heart, he spoke up and said, I'll pay for it. Uh, and we've been very fortunate uh, through obviously challenging times uh, since 2015, 2016. Uh, to continue to get that support. So thanks, thanks, Etta, but thanks to your colleagues and the leadership for supporting it. Uh, this is about an opportunity to think big about doing work you simply couldn't do. Otherwise, I can tell you, having sat in but not voted on these, uh, the committee is not impressed with small plans. Um, they really do admire people willing to work to do something that really stretches uh, and will make a difference. Uh, we have been startled by the variety and really pleased by the variety of proposals and the outcomes uh, of the ones that have been done. Uh, 
Uh, I have been very fortunate to have my name associated with this. It's the kind of work I, I could have only dreamt of doing. Uh, and it uh, makes you proud of the faculty and students and staff and community and the willingness, as you heard David describe, to put in the work, to build us relationships, to do something he hadn't done before in his class. Uh, and I think you got a sense of how to be successful if you listen to how you talked about what he did, the clarity of the ideas, uh, the originality. I mean, he is a religious studies professor and he's working with Medicaid uh, in the Indiana. I mean, that when you first saw that, you're like, wait, why is David Craig doing this? Uh, and then you read the proposal and you see exactly why. And why is somebody from here involved in visual communications? And you see that as well. So make the proposal, don't worry about it being bold, worry about it being clear and determined and really interesting. Because I think his point about the titles reflects this, the ideas, the titles that have been you know, really clever titles in Visible Indianapolis. You want to communicate in a heartbeat what it meant to have neighborhoods disappear and under a freeway. Uh, that did it. Uh, and I, I think you'll find that if you get that kind of insight, you, you're on your way to a good proposal. So I wish you all the best. Uh, appreciate you listening longer than I was assigned. Thanks. No, you're just fine. Thank you so much, Charles, for sharing the background and the, the spirit and the intent of how this was, des was designed. And so I was hearing you highlight the, the opportunity here as a way to really help and support faculty to springboard from their current space, but when they really want to go to the next level, but need that that year, that concentrated year with some strong support to make it happen, to pull all the pieces together and reminding applicants that the clarity in the application is what is going to be really important, that the, the reviewers are very clear about what they're looking for. And that's been articulated already and will be continued to be articulated as we walk through what does the application look like. So thank you for taking the time to do that. This is very helpful to hear. And it's, it is exciting to be a part of the review but to watch the review process and to see how this has come to life. And when we look at the uh, the past awardees, just the amazing background and variety of what happened. So to sum it up here, the Vance Community Awards are generously funded through a variety of resources, charitable gifts, and campus funding. And then both of these awards are supported by some folks on campus. So we have the Center for Translating Research into Practice, the Office of the Executive Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs, the Office of Community Engagement, and the Office of the Vice Chancellor for Research. So it's a campus-wide commitment to make this happen. There are two different awards that you've been hearing about. The first is the Community Fellowship, and that is, just as a reminder, intended to support or advance an established community-engaged research to advance the project to the next level. The amount of funding there is $40,000, but there is a 20% match required. We're going to hear more about what that looks like. And that is supported primarily by generous donors and some folks on campus. And then the Scholar Award is intended to support and advance an emerging community-engaged researcher to advance the project to the next level. The funding amount there is $25,000, also with a 20% match. It is generously supported by the Office of the Vice Chancellor for Research. We're going to get into the weeds of what some of the application requirements are, but I wanted to just do a quick flip through. You've already heard about some of these folks, but the original, the inaugural fellowship went to Stu Hyatt and Paul Mullins. And that year is when we also then launched the Scholar Award, which went to Richard Holden. And that was called Be Fit, a Community Partnership for Brain Health Promoting Information Technology. And then just get a sense of the breadth and depth of these awards. So you've already heard about Gabe Filippelli. I'm looking at lead. In 2017, he was named the fellow. The scholar award that year went to Carolyn Gentle Genity, who in fact today sent me another article that was directly related to this work. 
that they've been able to do um, some. And so you can always find out more about this if you go to our website. We highlight all this stuff. 2018, the fellowship went to both Wanda Thruston from nursing and Barbara Pierce in social work, and they were they've gone and done some great things. But um, another school approach, looking at trauma responsive services in schools. The scholar award that year went to Chris Santa Maria Graf, who was looking at families as faculty and partners in the education process. 2019. The fellowship went to Elizabeth Nelson, and that's a great backstory if you want to talk to her sometime about how that came to be, but she did her, has been doing her work in looking at women's prison and the experience that women have there and how they could be uh, talking about their own history, but also building their own skills in, in research, et cetera. And the scholar award that year went to Kim Saxton and Charlotte Westerhouse Renfro, and they were doing a very interesting project at the time about advancing Indianapolis women. In 2020, you've already heard from David Craig today, who is the fellow, and the Scholar Award went to Jessica Lee, who was focusing on the Burmese population and using a strength-based participatory research action um, approach to, to making a difference in that community. And then 2021, we had Leslie Atien and Tambra Jackson, who are working, who did a summer of service. Uh, they're still doing it, I believe, but it's uh, looking at uh, connecting kids to um, engage, to become engaged scholars. In the 2021, the Scholar Award went to Victoria Garcia Wilburn, who you might know has a new role in our community. She was just elected to the General Assembly in the state and in partnership with Devin Hensel. And they done a, an amazing job of understanding cravings and triggers in adolescents that are attending a recovery high school. Amazing project. Now this year, we are working with Lonnie Silva as the fellow who is looking at community engagement at its best, a whole holistic approach to prisoner reentry. And what is that all about? So we're still learning about this project. It's almost, you know, it's halfway through on the, the project as it goes July 1 through June 30th. And the Scholar Award went to Richard Brandon Friedman, who's looking at uh, families and their role in gender diverse youth and um, what happens to them. So you can find out more about these folks very simply by going to the TRIP website and looking under the community, the award section and the community fellows and, and finding out who these people are, a brief description about their work, but you can also talk to them. Any one of them would be happy to talk to you about the process, what their work was. You might even be able to ask some questions uh, uh, more specifically. Nuri put the link in the chat for you to make it easy, but we want to turn our attention now to the, the nitty gritty pieces, like what is this gonna take uh, for you as you're now thinking about it? You have a good sense of the intent of the award, the things that are really important around um, accessing this opportunity. And so how do you put it together in the form? And so I'm gonna unshare and let Teresa Bennett take over because she's gonna share with you the actual application process and try to walk you through what that's gonna look like. So Teresa, it's all yours. Thank you. I love it. I love it that I'm down in the weeds and nitty gritty. It makes me so happy. It's what I do best. So um, thank you all for joining us today. Um, I think that we had a few more people sign up and so we're recording and you can pass this along when you receive that recording to your own colleagues and we'll share it with those folks who weren't able to come. Um, I also want to say in advance that you can contact me, anybody in this, in our um, on this call, obviously, but you can contact me at any time to ask questions about the proposal, about um, things that don't seem clear, to review anything that you're working on that you're wondering a little bit about. We are a very, um, we are a very collaborative group. We want to see everyone succeed. We don't have skin in the game because we don't get to vote. But at the same time, it's really important that we give you the information that you need. And that's part of what I'm going to talk about today in terms of looking at the form and the rules and policies and expectations. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen with you and showing you something you probably possibly already viewed before. Um, can you all see the, the web page right now? Am I showing the right thing? Okay, good. Thank you very much. 
Um, I want to make sure that, okay, for those of you who have not looked at this page before, uh, this gives a lot of information. And it's kind of like we tell our students in classes that the syllabus is our contract with you. This is our contract with the BANTS applicant. And so it references both the fellowship award and the scholar award. These are, as already expressed, these are two separate awards and their intention is different, even though uh, much of the application is similar. So what you'll see here is a little bit of backstory that you've already received. I think it's important to stop for just a minute and draw your attention to the goals, the values at the heart of the BANTS award. And that is working in and with the community to learn together. Uh, on, on a one-year research project that ultimately translates into something that we hope improves people's lives. And you've already seen from the examples, these can be, when we say people, it could be communities, it could be schools, it could be individuals, it could be nonprofit organizations, but we're really looking at translating that research into something that's practical, useful, and can be embedded. We also find it very important that you offer students an opportunity to be part of your team, to be an important part of your team, to work on an innovative part of this, be involved in the planning, the research, the outreach, and ultimately the discovery and implementation. We, it's really, um, I think it goes without saying probably that we are thinking about this through the lens of an engaging and welcoming campus where everyone is involved and invited to the table and for that reason, the, what's not said here, but I think is intrinsic to this award, again, probably obviously, is that it's community engaged. It's community participating and community engaged. So with that, um, it leads us to you, if you don't already know this, and I, I can see from the people on this, on this um, Zoom meeting that you're all already embedded in this work. But if, there's, if you need to know anything else about community-engaged research, we give you a little bit of information here. I don't wanna to spend too much time on what you already know. There are, as we said, two awards. The Fellowship Award is a $40,000 one-year award. The Scholar Award is a $25,000 one-year award. And you'll be able to see here uh, a little more information about each. What these really distinguish in these two drop boxes is that the fellowship is intended to be awarded to someone who has significant connections in the community already. They've been doing a lot of work and they're trying to dig down even more into the work that's been done. The scholar award, different from the fellow award, we are encouraging new and promising research in this award. And so this is an opportunity where you probably already have the community engagement, but maybe have not had the longevity of, of the work, maybe have not had the deep roots with that partner yet, and this is an opportunity to gain those. So I just wanna draw your attention to that. You'll also see down uh, towards the end of the webpage, these are policies. And hopefully we've covered any questions you could ask, but if not, we're always here. Uh, eligibility is important. If you want to be the PI on one of the applications, the, there's a lot of information here about what we're looking for in that. Um, you'll see the terms, and I think Steve already mentioned that we the awards start on July 1st and end on June 30th, our academic year. Um, you'll see going on down how the funds should be used, how you should expect to use the funds when you're writing your budget and your proposal. Um, and how they cannot be used. We cannot use these funds to pay salaries to external partners, but we can certainly reimburse external partners for goods and services and resources that they expend. Um, as far as the, um, I think I skipped over it a little bit here, the match, the match funding, this can come from a lot of sources. The 20% match could come from uh, your external partner may contribute in-kind resources or cash resources. You could use your salary savings. There could be from a from your uh, office or your center contributing. It could be a third party that sponsors in some way. So we're not going to try to limit you too much on that. We just want to know that you, you've uh, got this other contribution involved. And that helps your money go further as well. Um, the awards process is uh, it, it is a competitive selection process. And on the awards judging committee each year, we gain more and more and more past 
uh, awardees on the judging review panel. And that is because if you look at the lowest, the responsibility here at the bottom, we expect you as a BANTS fellow or a BANTS scholar to continue to contribute. So contribute through your research, contribute by mentoring colleagues and students and contribute by being involved in presentations about the BANTS work that you've done and as a reviewer on the BANTS panel going forward. So any questions about that before I move on to the form? I Wonderful, that's great. So I'm going to now share with you the form, which you possibly have already looked at this too, um, but we just wanted to point out a few things to make sure that you were aware. And I've already, um, I've received some questions and calls from folks already. And so that, that signals that even though we have a lot of information here, it's oftentimes you want a little one-to-one -one conversation. So I'm gonna try and walk through this in a way that gives you um, a snapshot of what you'll find when you get here, because as David Craig pointed out, I like to say it's not like doing your taxes, but you do have to prepare. So there's a lot of information required. And uh, if anything is unclear as you're walking through it, again, reach out, we'll talk with you about it. So you can review a PDF of the form um, and, and you'll be able to do that on your own. But today what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna go into the form itself so you can see. Um, when you first enter the form, you'll see that there are a lot of check boxes. This is because we want to help you to know what you have, need to have already prepared before you begin. It's designed to allow you, if you stay on the same browser, it's designed to let you come back, but we do not have a save button. And so there's no guarantee. So we, we sort of encourage you to plan ahead, um, perhaps get the PDF, create a Word document that you can copy paste from and before you move on into the form. So um, just that's just a little, little hint. Uh, once you get in here, this is to say, yes, I've got all of this. I've got my PI information. I've got my picture ready to upload. I've got my Vita ready to upload. I've got my co-investigator information ready to upload. I've thought about that title, that catchy title. Um, and I have a 60 word abstract ready to upload. I thought about how community engagement really impacted my professional life and my work in the university. I have an overview of the research project and I've thought about the community issue that's really at the heart of what I'm working on. Um, I have the team planned out. I've got their roles in, in mind and, and re ready to be entered in. I've got um, some information about my partners. I've put together information um, about that funding, how I'm gonna think about this. We'd like for these, not like, we have seen these, the, the Vance Scholarship Award and the Vance Fellow Award really move a career forward. People, the faculty who have been involved have leveraged those to other awards. And, and there's a lot of other opportunities that come through this, this uh, Vance portal. And so we want you to talk a little bit about while you don't know everything that's going to happen in the future, you probably do have some ideas for things that you'll be looking forward to as you complete this first year. So thinking about that ahead. The role of your partner, it's very important. The reviewers are gonna be looking for the keys that tell them that you've thought about how the partner is truly a partner and not a recipient, that you've considered how they're gonna be involved in the planning all the way to the launch and implementation. Um, we have some uh, information in here that'll help you with the timeline and, we, and the budget. In fact, we even have a template for your budget what's your research timeline, you're gonna think about that and then you're gonna use, there's no form for that one. Um, you're gonna use whatever forms work for you. And then we will expect references. So have you thought about those? Do you have those at the ready? Do you have your Dean and department chair on speed dial? Do they know this is coming? Uh, do you have the names and emails of your community partners that, you, that are gonna be able to uh, write on your behalf? And then the detailed budget form, as I mentioned. So you click yes, yes, yes. And now you're in, assuming everything goes as planned. And it didn't, so. Did 
do this all again. It only works when you're not trying. Okay, to the charm. All right, so as you can see, there's a lot of information here that you can enter in. Um, and, and I will tell you, I did this test quite a long time ago and I'm happy to see that it popped back up. So that does tell me that browser save does work. So that's good news for all of us. Um, as I said, there's upload options here. So you'll be able to easily present your information. Um, it's very important that you've thought ahead about, we keep the word count is purposefully brief. We want you to be succinct. We want you to be clear. We want you to have thought about those goals and how you want to present them to the reviewers. Um, so you can see there's there's not a lot of space in some of these for the for long um, um, conversations, I guess. Um, so think think about this ahead. Take a look at the PDF. And as I said, one of the things we encourage is write it write it before you even enter into the system, and then you can do some cut and paste and editing there. So. We've already looked through what these are. These all relate to those yes check boxes, um, but describing the roles of the team. I'm not gonna say any question is more important than another question to the reviewers, but I can tell you having listened to the reviewers all these years, they do stop quite a bit on several things such as how the deliverable, what's the intervention that you're planning? How is this really gonna impact a community? Um, what is the issue at the core? And that that's a signal to the reviewers that you really understand your community. You're not trying to do something to your community. You're doing something with your community. Um, how you're gonna evaluate the success of your work, um, the roles of the team and the team members. What are the students going to do? What are the community partners going to do? Who else will be engaged in this work with you? Um, how you're going to build upon this work, the depth, the, the value, the, the longevity of your relationships. This is an important thing. Um, and we don't give you a lot of time, as I say, a lot of space to say it. So how, if you were awarded this, do you think you would seek future funding? And describing how you're going to implement the project ultimately um, and disseminate it. And this is another thing. We haven't forgotten about your academic goals as well. So Talk to us a little bit about how you're going to disseminate it in your academic professional life as well as in your community. Um, and I think then the budget narrative, you're used to seeing these kinds of things. These are not new. Um, and then this is where you're going to put in your references. This section is really your reference section. And so what happens is you're not going to upload a letter from your references. You're going to give us the information and we're going to reach out to your references with a form that they'll complete um, with regard with your chair or your dean. It will be a more traditional reference letter, but with the community partners, we have a set of questions that we'll deliver to them. They can respond to and write and send back to us. So we'll take care of all that for you. And then here's where you upload the additional supporting documents. The detailed budget, um, your timeline, you can use whatever form you want. I've had somebody ask about that. I've seen Gantt charts. I've seen very simple tables. They all work well. So whatever works for you is fine. Um, and um, the other thing is it, it happens quite a bit where someone will say, I just don't feel like the form gave me an option to answer this particular question or to elaborate on something that I think is really important. You can upload that into the additional documents. So if there's something you need us to know, if there's some sort of um, brochure or handout or informational sheet, or you really just wanna write more, you can put that into the additional documents. Um, right here, don't pay attention to this. I'm gonna get this corrected. This detailed timeline doesn't apply. It's actually, the timeline is above. So this is just a spot for additional information as needed. Um, I, before I navigate away from this, are there any questions from anyone? Teresa, I wanted to just clarify for folks that when we were talking about the community partner references, what we're asking for is the name and the electronic email 
connection because we're going to ask them to respond electronically. They don't need to write a letter. They're going to be able to get a link and respond. So you, you would want to let them know that. Yes, that yeah, that's, to... a, that's a good point. Let them know it's coming. Um, and I'll also, I'll take just a second to tell you why we do it this way, is we found that it um, it can be limiting, depending on who your community partner is, they may not be used to writing letters of reference. And so we didn't think it was fair in, in the review that some applicants would have these long, detailed, glowing letters of references and others would have less than that. And, and that really wasn't what we were trying to get to. So now we knew we use a, a sort of a survey form and we ask everyone the same information so that it's apples to apples, I guess you'd say from your, from your uh, community partners. And it also takes the burden off the partner to know what to write about. So that, that's why we do that. But you're absolutely right, Steve, um, for all of your references, you give us the information, we'll take care of the rest, but you should let them know it's coming. Don't want them to be surprised. So, so, and Sophia Wing, Wang was asking if there's a way for the applicant to know when those emails are sent so because in case they get lost or something. I know we have yes. suggested in the past that you follow up with your, your partners to make sure that you let them know that it's coming, you let them know that you've made the application, have them check, and if they didn't get it, you, you can always come back to Teresa and she can resend it, mm -hmm. right? Yes. yes. Yes, and you will get a uh, you will get a copy. So once you submit your application, you will get back information to show you what you've submitted. And when your partners and your deans are when they get that letter requesting their reference, you'll be cc'd on that. So you'll also know that these went out. But that still doesn't mean we always get them back in a timely manner. So I'll reach out again and do some reminders. And sometimes I have to come back to you and say, could you do a little nudge with your community partners? But for the most part, people respond pretty quickly. And so, Teresa, I'm hearing you say that, the, that as you mentioned earlier, it's a collaborative process. So on the back end, we're looking at all these things because we want all the pieces there. And so you do a nice job of letting people know if something's missing. So that yes. it's not, that isn't a reason that you would be, there isn't a, like a goal to go up, oh, you missed that, so you're out. It's more of like, how do we make sure all the pieces are in place and try to support you in your application process to make sure that we've got those because they're really important pieces. That's why we've done it this way, to exactly. really understand the, the goal of your project and the partnership, et cetera. Well, and we want everyone other... to succeed. We want, we want to make sure yeah. that every single person who's interested in applying has a great application and then we move it on to the reviewers. So any questions you have, um, I, as I said before, if you wanna create a Word document and get some advice here and there, we're always happy to take a look. We, again, we're not voting, but we can give you some information. This might be a good place to, to mention that the there are often ideas and suggestions generated during the review process, because obviously there's only one fellowship and one scholarship award, and there's usually more than one application for each. But the, the review process does generate a lot of ideas, and those are shared back with right. all the applicants so that they've got the benefit of, well, here's maybe some other resources or some other places to go or things to think about, which yes. leads us nicely into our next speaker. Unless there's a burning question for Teresa, I want to welcome Ed Award from the Office well, of the Vice Chancellor. Before we for research. move on, I, I just wanted to let you know when we do make our decision, um, we send an email, a personal email to every applicant with um, a lot of information and feedback. So you will have that. In addition to that, because we've had such a um, hard time making these decisions, we also will give you information about other resources that we think could be sources of funding for your project. Um, so again, yeah. we want everyone to succeed. We'd, we'd love to do all the projects and we can't. Um, so, so that's our way of trying to pay you forward and keep you going on the research. And then the other thing that we do, we offer you the opportunity uh, to be mentored. If you didn't receive the award, um, we, if you're if you're interested, we can assign you to a past awardee or a faculty member who's been on the review panel who would talk with you about your proposal and help you to strengthen it so that you'll apply again next year. So, or do other you. kinds of things. Exactly. Wonderful. Thank Great. you so much. So that is a nice segue into that there are 
other resources on our campus that uh, go a long way in supporting development of faculty in their research agenda. And so we're delighted to have Etta here. Etta, I have two slides that for you, and I'm gonna pull those up now and turn over the conversation to you and sure. um, let you introduce yourself and go from there. Yeah, so thank you. Um, yeah, I am Etta Ward. I am, uh, okay, how do I say this? I am currently the Assistant Vice Chancellor for Research Development <laughs> slash to be determined. Um, for those who don't know, um, our research office has been centralized up to the Vice President's office and we are in some transition, but we are still here to serve and support uh, our research community, especially our research faculty. So thank you for having me. And it's been a pleasure and continues to be a pleasure to be a partner in this effort. I put in the 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 chat a link to our IU IUPUI research index site. Um, that's a site website that um, our office worked with IU Studios to keep updated for our IUPUI research community and anyone who might be looking for an IUPUI researcher. So this, this slide right here might be and is uh, a little outdated. Let me just look and see. I think I, um, yeah, I think we could still work from this, but to be quite clear, um, with all the changes happening at IUPUI, uh, we understand that things have been a little bit hard to find. And again, this link should get you where you need to be um, and help you to access other research resource materials. Um, I, I often say, used to say that the primary mode of communication for our office has always been a newsletter we called Research Enterprise, but that too has gone away. So what you want to stay connected to is this link here and what you see on this slide, the research.iu.edu is the larger IU research site. And yes, there are resources that from our website will get you straight to what you need there. Um, our services are now um, really starting to streamline around our president's three areas of uh, priority. Um, that is student success. Um, it's also um, research, of course. But then the third arm is uh, our impact in the community. So all of this plays into what our president sees as the university's three primary areas of, of um, focus. And so the scholar and the fellow awards help us to continue to advance the research and the innovation coming out of our, our um, campus. We have uh, several opportunities, and I don't know what's on the next slide, uh, Stephen, Steve. Yeah, um, I'll just say for this one, if you are a scholar or researcher and you um, have not engaged with that site that uh, that Steve just had up, um, uh, you could you could go back to it later. Um, there is there is a site that site right there. So please mark that site and just know that we have been behind the scenes, we being our staff in the research uh, office, have been behind the scenes um, populating your research information to this site. This search for scholars at IU is a part of our Pivot site, which is uh, Pivot is a tool that we have a subscription to as a university to help you easily and efficiently find funding. So. There's a question that Teresa um, alluded or actually said uh, in the in the application that asks, how are you going to continue your research through external funding? Um, the external funding is through the Pivot site. You could get that information through our office. Um, but this site right here kind of links to it because sometimes we also need to know who else is a, a, a scholar that can help me in my research, who could be a partner. Um, sometimes the community wants to know about us and our researchers, and so this site is outward facing, allowing the community to search for you. All that to say, take a minute to go to this site, make sure the information that we put out there for you is up to date, 
Um, we're trying to make it easy for our scholars. Now, if you don't mind going to the website, uh, Stephen. And our website is pretty, I think, intuitive. So if we stop right here, um, the left nav is where you want to focus your attention. It's going to help direct you to the very specific areas that we can provide support in. First one, always we're supportive of undergraduate research, but for you, again, finding funding or funding resources, you might want to go there to maybe start doing some searches for the type of research that you might be doing in uh, this proposal uh, for the, the Vance uh, Fellow or Scholar Award. And you might pull some of that language from those funding opportunities into your application because what I know the reviewers look for in this in the sense of you know long term sustainability of the work that you're doing they're going to want to know a little more detail than I'm going to go after an external grant proposal or grant funding you might you might want to find an opportunity that somewhere down the line you might be able to pursue and mention that opportunity and possibly even a deadline. So the connections to the funding resources is going to get you to external and internal funding that could help support your research. Um, we also have proposal development support um, that if you are in the middle of putting together a large scale or even a, a, a moderate proposal for the work that you're doing, we do have proposal development um, specialists that can help organize that and uh, get you to, the, to the, the resources and the information you need to put that proposal through for external funding. The thing for them is that you actually have to put in a request. It's a really short request form that says, I need some help, um, please, um, please assist. Um, and they will get back with you. Of course, we have research events and you can always come to those to just learn what's happening. Um, but uh, with regards to um, funding, I think you really need to focus in on those funding resources, either internal or external. We, we offer these resources as a part of this program um, with regards to the scholars in particular. We have funding set aside, but you could also come to our site and potentially request um, um, release time for research funding. And that's normally what folks who get um, these awards do. They, they say, well, we have our awards from the fellow program and from the scholar program, but you know, I need some release time so I can actually do it. And so you would work with our office um, as awardees to actually re get those funds released to you as a part of this award. So it's a little bit more than the 2500 for the scholar award. We also try to tie in um, link to the, the release time for funding award, which is $10,000 to pay for a course release or to pay for someone to actually step in while you do your research. Um, I think that's the most relevant. Yes, Teresa. I have a question. Yeah. I know things have changed and the research office is, is uh, in, a, in, in a new position now. In the past, we had an agreement that the awardees were not guaranteed, but had a pretty fast track to release time. Is that still in fact? That, that, that is still, I'm going to okay. say it publicly because okay. we're not, we not changing anything just yet with in, any of our internal grant mechanisms. So right now we're supporting things as we have in the past. And so that is true. That's the whole point of mentioning the release time for, for uh, research is RTR. Um, once uh, our office knows who the awardee is. Um, we will work with the, uh, Teresa and Steve to make sure uh, the awardees for our part of it get that funding, um, including the RTR, the, the okay. release time and, for funding. Well, and the other reason that's important is because <clears throat> if you know that's a possibility, you can then factor that into your budget. So the yeah. fellow and the scholar, you may not want to use some of your your budget for your own time when you can, if approved by your dean, get release time funding. And that really builds your budget for the fellowship up to 50000 and your scholar award up to, to 35000 So I just wanted to put that 
information out there as a way to think about strategically think about your budget. And and Teresa makes a, a, a good point that you, you can't assume that anything that we're offering with regards to release time is going to over, override any policy or process that your school has set up. We just put your 10,000 out there and then you go in and you, you get that release time approved through your school the, the way they have it set up. But it is fair to say that your office is um, available to help any any faculty member navigate that process or to provide information. Absolutely. Um, in addition to all the many other things. So I hope all of you have a Pivot account, for example. I find that one of the most useful emails I get once a week is to yeah. have a summary of, of funding opportunities. I'm going to put our person's name in here. She normally, if I'm not here, she would come. Alicia Gayheimer is that person who's responsible for helping faculty to connect and effectively use the, the Pivot site. Um, and I'm sure that her name is actually somewhere on this PowerPoint, but I'm just going to put her email address in the chat. Perfect. Um, the other thing I'll bring that's related, I'll bring up related to that is that, so let's say you get the award, you get the fellowship, and you, you've planned into your budget that you will be expecting the RTR funding, and then your dean says, no, I really can't release you in this way. Um, we, we will work with you to readjust your budget because things happen. Certainly during COVID, things happened. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't mean because something didn't go as expected when you apply in January and don't begin the work until July. Uh, it doesn't mean you're held to that. You're held to the, to the values you put forward, to the goals you set forward and to the partnerships that you embedded into your proposal, but we will work with you on the budget should things change at the beginning or even along the way. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Etta, for sharing mm -hmm. that amazing news and resource. We're so glad that we have this connection and partnership and sure. to make this available to folks that are applying. So Absolutely. before we flip to questions for you all, I wanna make you aware of one more opportunity that we have not mentioned yet, but it is part of this family of opportunity. And that is with the gracious support of Charles Vance and Sandra Petronio, they created the Vance Petronio Translating Research into Practice Faculty Award, um, even a few years prior to this fellowship award. And it, it recognizes outstanding translational research by an IUPUI faculty member. It, uh, applications are open once a year. You can uh, find that on the same website that you can find access to, to the Vance Fellow and, and Scholarship Awards. And I'm happy to answer any questions about that. Um, I'm not on the review committee on that one either, but I can tell you about it. And if you want to know about the past awardees, when you're shopping on the TRIP website to learn more about the fellowship and scholar awards, you can go to a different tab right there to learn about the Vance Petronio Awards. So that comes with a $1,000 amount, but your, your commitment there is an opportunity is that you would partner with the Center for Translating Research into Practice for a year, and you would present at the annual showcase where the award is officially given, but you get to share about your work. So just wanted to make sure you had that opportunity there. And thank you, Nura, for putting the direct link into the chat, which gets us to a place of discussion and, and see if there's any questions. We know we had said we'd be here for an hour. Um, we're able to stay on a few minutes longer if anybody has particular questions, whether that's right now or later. And, and you, you're going to get this information in a follow-up from Nuri. She's really good about sending you all this information, so you'll have it. But know that, as we kept saying, you're welcome to contact any of us for these different kinds of questions that you might have. So I'll stop sharing so that we can see you all and see if you have any questions or comments, things that you want to talk about while we're here together.